Hello and welcome to Quadriga, DW's international talk show coming to you from Berlin. I'm Brian Thomas and on our show today, you've seen them for about three months now, every weekend out on the streets of Hong Kong. Thousands of protesters calling for democracy and the rule of law. At one protest, 1.7 million people peacefully staking their claim on freedom. Police holding back, this time with no tear gas and no rubber bullets. But will Beijing give Hong Kong the freedom and autonomy it so desperately wants? And why has the West been so reluctant to unequivocally back up the protesters and their calls for democracy? Our topic today, China's power play, Hong Kong betrayed. To talk about this, I'm joined by Hua Gui from DW's Asia Desk. He says, China wanted to experiment with the rule of law and democracy in Hong Kong with one country, two systems, and now also has to make concessions. Bernard Botch is a senior expert on Asia for the Bertelsmann Foundation, based here in Berlin. He says, Hong Kong is the epicenter of a global competition of systems. Western democracies should show solidarity and resilience and the ability to learn. And Cherry Chan is from Hong Kong, works for DW's social media team in Berlin. She says, China's propaganda war is only uniting the people of Hong Kong, and they will not stop fighting on the streets until they get a real response from the government. Thanks so much to all of you for being here today and to our viewers, of course, from around the world as well. Wow, if we could start with you. You know, you say that um, it's, it's all a matter of of the people talking in in Hong Kong um, and of Beijing experimenting with this uh, city. Have they lost control of the laboratory, the laboratory that is right Hong Kong right now for the Chinese government are, and are events taking on a life of their own? Yeah, one see it is out of control. Beijing never controls Hong Kong in the real meaning, but uh, it's a lot of control of the public image and the international world. Uh, the situation in Hong Kong is uh, like it is uh, the Hong Kong trying to be the part of the one country, two systems, be the part of the one of the two systems. And what, what they're demanding are democracy and rule of law is written in the law, and that's what they're demanding, but Beijing is not ready to give them the freedom. Okay, two, um, two countries, two, two one systems, countries, one two country. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the systems is clearly uh, totalitarian, the one in, in Beijing. Hong Kong has been free to this point. Uh, Bernard, you say that Hong Kong's on its way to becoming a police state. Um, at least the police have played um, a role in the last couple of weeks that I think has surprised a lot of Hong Kongers because in Hong Kong there was a lot of trust in institutions mm -hmm. and the police and the, the police violence that we've seen and that hasn't been independently um, researched um, is something that has shocked Hong Kong, Kong, Hong Kongers, and is really at the, at the heart of this conflict mm. now which for Hong Kongers and Cherry knows better um, than we all do, is a conflict about what is our city going to be like in the future? Is it going to be just any Chinese city or is it going to remain a, a different system? Okay, let's point out for our viewers that it's 2047, right, that uh, Hong Kong reverts to complete Chinese rule. So there's this window of opportunity there. Uh, uh, Cherry, as a Hong Konger, how is this city different from the rest of China? Um, Born and raised in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong people. I'm I'm from there, and then we always see freedom at almost the same standard as how the Western world is seeing it. Um, we also know people from China. We have friends from mainland China, and uh, when we talk, when we discuss, we know that we have a difference. Uh, when we look at freedom, for example, uh, we always have a relatively high freedom of speech, freedom of media. We can get access to Facebook and Twitter and the internet without any restrictions, which mm -hmm. is very different from the mainland China. Okay, and it's also the court system as well. Uh, Hong Kong has been so successful because it has an independent court system. There is the rule of law. That is also a main 
main difference along with freedom of expression, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, in Hong Kong, we always trust our judicial system and we know that it's independent from the administration. Um, we know we have always trusted that um, the government would not intervene easily into any uh, judicial process or any judicial decisions. OK, so it's a long way from where we are today to a police state that so many people fear. Um, how one of the uh, problems that Hong Kong protesters have been pointing to is the extradition law that the citizens of Hong Kong, if they are charged with a cr crime, would disappear to mainland China, basically. What's behind these fears of being extradited to mainland China? Why is that so terrifying for Hong Kong people? Well, the reason is pretty clear, because uh, Hong Kong is a city ruled by law, but in mainland China, it is not the case. Therefore, some criminals uh, accused in Hong Kong, uh, they, if, they, uh, extra, uh, if they go to, to uh, mainland China, their fear is not a very transparency uh, proceed uh, uh, in the court. That's the main reason for the whole protest. But, but now, this bill is dead, says Carrie Lam, the uh, CEO of the country. But uh, it's just the beginning of the long protest, because what they finally demand is their uh, democracy in a real meaning like we understand here in West. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what do you think, Bernard? Uh, what are the chances that this real democracy, is how I put it, as we know in the West, can be protected by Carrie Lam, the current uh, leader of the city of Hong Kong? I don't think promoting democracy is the job that Carrie Lam <laughs> has been given by the Beijing government. Um, the basic law um, said that potentially Hong Kong could have free elections. It's not very definitive. It's, a, it's a, an unclear um, law, but that is what Hong Kong people have been hoping for mm. the longest time, that at one point there will be full democracy. And Beijing has made it very clear in the last couple of years that that is not going to happen. And it's Carrie Lam's job um, to, to now squash these protests. Okay. Peking, Peking says it could happen but uh, Hong Kong says it should happen. Yes. Oh, because in the basic law, it says eventually and gradually it would happen, not potentially. So we believe that in the end, it would happen. And we are looking forward to this. OK, Cherry, um, you also pointed to earlier social media. Uh, that's uh, very much part of uh, China's propaganda warfare mm -hmm. aimed at uh, not only the people inside Hong Kong, but uh, the mainland Chinese as well. Um, it shows that uh, Beijing really wants to get a control of this process the protest process as quickly as possible. Is there a fear in Beijing, and how this question would apply to you as well, um, that, that the protests will, will leave Hong Kong and move to other parts of, of the country, that we could see protests elsewhere in China as a result? Yeah, um, I think the propaganda war by China is not very, obviously not very successful in Hong Kong, and it's not very successful in the international media as well, because Hong Kong people have been very used to this kind of propaganda or state media, their, their statements, and Hong Kong people mainly use it, mainly see it as a joke more than believing what they're saying. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and also Hong Kong people are really trying, actually, they are really trying to get international attention, and there are a lot of uh, protests organized in other countries, as you said. Uh, how, but, but, but could the social media propaganda and other propaganda lead to protests that will move to other parts of China, or do you think that's, that's uh, a situation that's to be excluded? that these protests are not transferable to the Uyghurs, uh, for example, the minority Muslims? Uh, I don't think they're going to move somewhere in, other, in any other Chinese cities because it's not going to work. Uh, because uh, the China, Hong Kong is still a free city. You may go to street and demonstration, but in China, the simple ways, we don't know exactly what happened. It happened really happened in mainland China. We don't know what exactly happened, why it happens. And uh, the police have a very strong hand and they will make you disappear for a long period. Mm -hmm. And that's this very risk, risk uh, for all the participants. OK, we're going to uh, focus more now on the propaganda war being waged on numerous affronts by Beijing. Those fronts include global social media platforms, state-run media, from entertainment to films to internet news sites, and of course, to state-run TV as well. This is how Chinese state media are presenting the situation in Hong Kong, as a city in chaos, with masked protesters prepared for violence, whom they accuse of being bandits and terrorists. 
This is the Chinese government's take on the temporary occupation of Hong Kong airport. We express our strongest condemnation of this near-terrorist act and express our deepest condolences to the injured mainland compatriots and Hong Kong police. The newspapers are also full of images of violence. This propaganda seems to be plausible for some citizens. I think that it's okay to take to the streets and protest in a normal way, but you shouldn't destroy public order and carry out violent acts. Only terrorists do that kind of thing. State media have also been showing these images of troop exercises in Shenzhen on the border with Hong Kong. But will China really resort to arms to crush the resistance in Hong Kong? Bernard, what do you think about Chinese uh, propaganda aimed at Hong Kong and the rest of China? How effective is it? And, and, and it's different, isn't it? We heard from Cherry that it's not very effective in Hong Kong. What about on mainland China? Do people buy all of it? <laughs> That's the big question. I think the interesting thing, and you pointed to that, is that in Hong Kong, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work, although there's been more than 20 years of strong propaganda, strong propaganda mm. in schools, and it didn't work. And I think this demonstration came as a surprise to Beijing because Beijing thought, we have this covered. So the big question in mainland China is, do people believe all the propaganda? Yes, in a way, um, they do. It's what they're fed with. But it doesn't mean that they are happy with the system, that they're happy with their own lives, and that there's not a lot of undercurrents of dissatisfaction that could blow up. Nobody had a protest like in Hong Kong on their books. Mm. And the big question for Beijing is how is it con going to control its own population? Okay. Uh, 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 how, what, what do you think? What, what is China not getting right about Hong Kong? Why is the propaganda not succeeding there? Is it simply that Hong Kong people have access to Western media? Is that what's going on there? There is no thing China is, which is very good. It's like a metaphor for this uh, reason. Because the, the old Asian Chinese, when intellectual, when writing from upstairs to downstairs, when they're reading old books, it always... Mm -hmm. Why Hong Kong? I see Hong Kong. I regard Hong Kong as part of Western. They're right from left to the right hand side. You just always say no, and just in, in Beijing. They, so it's they, tied into the body's yes. response and how we read. That's exactly. Yeah. That's they, they, <laughs> okay. they, they know everything what the party in the states say. It's true. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have the second source, an independent source, because of uh, censorship. Uh, that's the reason. And uh, I don't think uh, the Chinese uh, state-run uh, media is going to have the control. They might have a control of the public opinion within the mainland China, but what they want is having an international opinion, a China-friendly international opinion, what they are uh, trying to flood all the, the Facebook and Twitter. Okay. Uh, Cherry, what do you think? If propaganda is not going to work, what are the options for Beijing to get Hong Kong in line? Um, to answer all the demands of Hong Kong people, first of all, this is, I think, um, in every mind of Hong Kong citizens, they know very well what they want and what they are fighting for, and they are not going to stop until they get the demands answered. And also there's one thing to point out um, about um, media in uh, public opinions in China. Um, maybe Chinese government think that they could control the public opinion, but the fact is that Chinese people, they are so afraid to speak out that it's never, we are never able to get what they're really thinking because they cannot speak on social media, they cannot speak on camera. So maybe they are really thinking like Hong Kong people as well, but mm. it's just that they can never speak out. Maybe they want the same freedoms, but we simply don't know that. Okay, mm -hmm. well, the Chinese Communist Party's track record on respecting human rights is, of course, dismal. The occupation of Tibet, the destruction of its culture, the internment of over a million Uyghur Muslims, uh, of course, as well, and the bloody suppression of the democracy movement at Tiananmen Square in 1989. Now, this was the central point of Beijing's efforts to uh, crush the human rights movement 30 years ago. And it was a, a savage reality when tanks literally rolled over young presters, uh, protesters in the Square of Heavenly Peace. We all, all remember that um, in Tiananmen Square. Young men and women who had the audacity, just like the courageous citizens of Hong Kong today, to call for their voices to be heard 
to demand that their voices matter just as much as the highest functionary in the Communist Party and that all people must be equal before the law. That was, was what it was all about back then and is now. And the question is, those voice, those voices 30 years ago, they were drowned out in blood. We haven't heard them since then, not in the way that we're hearing them now, at least in Hong Kong. It's a big question, I know, but after looking at the images of Tiananmen Square from 30 years ago, um, Bernard, if we could start with you, should we be concerned about the possibility of another Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong? I think we should be concerned, but I don't think it's very likely. Tiananmen is still a trauma for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Beijing knows that it would be drastic if the PLA the People's Liberation Army actually went into Hong Kong. And I don't think it's necessary nowadays because the party has different means of putting people under pressure. It has all the technical means. It has the companies that are being put under a lot of pressure now, Cathay Pacific mm -hmm. and many others. So I don't see a big likelihood. At the same time, I don't see a very good outcome for the Hong Kong people. It's going to be a very unhappy ending, I'm afraid. A very unhappy ending, okay. What do you think that means, Jerry? What would be a very unhappy ending? Have you excluded, as Bernard has, the possibility of another Tiananmen Square? Um, I think Hong Kong people, they are very well aware that China is trying to scared Hong Kong people with mm -hmm. violence and the possibility of sending the army. Um, I think many of them just try to ignore the fact, or even if they know about this, they will think that they have nothing to lose. If it ends up like this, they would they would take other action then. But then, for now, their only demand is to have answers from the government. Uh, what do you think, Hal? I don't, I don't think this, uh, it's the Tiananmen Square happened again. China, 30 years ago, is was completely different from the China today. Because China says, always says it's now a responsible big nation on the international world, and uh, they're going not to use force because in other international conflict, China always says we want peaceful meaning to solve the problem. They can be that China says, when I have a problem in my home, in backyard, I just make my soldier, I send my soldier to give it clear that there's no problem anymore. It's, it's not unreasonable. And another uh, argument uh, is uh, China is going to celebrate uh, 60 years uh, founding of the People's Republic China on the beginning of October. That's coming up, yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe they're going to be st have a very, very bad image in the international press when the PRA is um, marching to Hong Kong. Okay, so China plays a very long game, though, the Communist Party, in Beijing. Um, if we look at the past, if we look at what's happened in Tibet, mm -hmm. what happened at Tiananmen Square, the internment of the Uyghurs, I mean, Beijing is not adverse to uh, reverting to force at the end of the day. It couldn't work because Hong Kong has another legal framework. This is a part of another system. The legal framework says the PRA could be sent to Hong Kong if the CE, the leader of Hong Kong, officially asked Beijing to do that. But I'm not saying Carrie Lam, the leader of the city, is going to do that. OK, well, how has the West uh, responded? There's been a mixed response. French and German leaders have called for dialogue about the situation. The US Congress has condemned China's heavy-handed police response. President Trump has called on the Chinese president to exercise restraint. I'd like to see Hong Kong worked out in a very humanitarian fashion. I hope President Xi can do it. He sure has the ability, I can tell you that from personal knowledge. He certainly has the ability to do it if he wants to. So I'd like to see that worked out in a humanitarian fashion. I think it would be very good for the trade deal that we're talking about. Jerry, I believe it's only Donald Trump uh, who's responded to this uh, in terms of a high-level uh, world of politician. Is the U.S. the only country that can bring pressure to bear on Beijing? Uh, I think Hong Kong people are trying to to ask the international community, not only the, not, not only, only the US, but also the EU, also Germany, England, to put pressure on China. But they are also very well aware that only, like, if it's only words, it wouldn't really work. Like, what, like even if international community is condemning China, um, if there are no other action, for example, economic sanctions or uh, real action, uh, their words wouldn't mean anything. Okay, what do you think, Al? 
uh, expressing concerns kind of pressure. And China has to seriously take, take, take into consider. Um, uh, sanctions is not the way out. The single way out would be that Beijing and Hong Kong, they're going to negotiate in the framework of one country, two systems, about the way, a timetable at least, how the democrat, uh, democracy could be implemented in Hong Kong, like a, direct, uh, like a, a general election. Okay, now, now, when I'm listening to Cherry, though, mm -hmm. that's already been decided. It's 2047 when uh, China reassumes control of Hong Kong. Until then, the Chinese uh, people, or the people of Hong Kong, rather, want democracy. Uh, the way I'm hearing you is that, Cherry, that's non-negotiable. Yeah, because for us, we don't believe... That. What we are trying to ask for is the extension of one country, two system. We don't want to believe that by 2047, we would become just another city of China. We want to have an extension. We want to have the two system forever. Okay, the two system forever. Let's take a listen now to some of the protesters and what they have to say about their hopes, their fears, and their dreams for Hong Kong. The more we come out to protest, the more people will be arrested. But we still will not leave until we get what we want. During these two months, we lost a lot of time, we lost a lot of money, we lost a lot of health because of the expired tear gas. But we can easily recover from the harm of tear gas. We can earn back our money. But if we lose this fight, Hong Kong's democracy will never be recovered. Uh, we share the same values as US and EU, that we fight for democracy, we fight for justice. And so we hope uh, those countries can stand up and speak out for Hong Kong. Okay, after listening to those protesters, are what we're seeing in Hong Kong, or is it something that's shaping up to be another clash of cultures? On one side, clearly a one party, ideological system on the other, a multi-party democracy that supports the rule of law. Is this a clash of uh, cultures um, that we're seeing take place focused on Hong Kong that has to do with China? I prefer the term competition of systems. Um, none of us has an interest in a real clash, mm -hmm. but we're definitely in a global situation where we have the established Western democracies on the one hand, on the other hand, we have a rise of authoritarian systems led by China. And that is part of the conflict that is playing out there. That is part of why the US is getting involved on a high level, because the US and China have this trade and everything else war going on. So more trouble for Xi Jinping is something that Donald Trump obviously enjoys. But it's also something that concerns us in Europe, because in Hong Kong, we, say, we see the playbook that China is using to um, handle dissent and, and calls for democracy. And that is a much, much broader question. How is it more of a, a clash or a competition? I, mean, I prefer the word, the term uh, coexisting, because okay. it's a two system. <laughs> Should be coexisted, and what China uh, doesn't want is that the, between the, one, the two systems, that one system is challenging another. It should be a coexistence. That's a, keep the whole one country stable. Okay, so uh, Cherry, is the West's uh, approach right now a good one? Should the West back off, uh, avoid provoking China, not looking like it's um, being involved in the protests right now? Um, well, speaking from uh, the perspective of a Hong Kong person, of course, we would like the West to speak out more, uh, to give more pressure to China, but then maybe it's not in the best interest of th all these Western countries because of all the other reasons, because of economy, because of trade. But then uh, if we are just speaking about the value of democracy and freedom, then obviously the Western world has this responsibility to stand up. Mm -hmm. How should, the, how should the West, uh, Bernard, stay up, stand up? What does it need to do to show to the rest of the world that it indeed believes in the values on which it's based? I think showing solidarity is important. I think honesty is also important. I would be very happy for leading European politicians to come out and say, we support this. Um, this is a legitimate show of concern by the Hong Kong people. China is trying to undermine the legitimacy of these protests and we should show, no, this is legitimate. And on the other hand, we should also be very open in saying, 
you can't, you can expect this from us, but you can't expect more. We have interests in China. We are in a very different, um, very difficult situation. This is how far we can support you, but please see the complicated situation that we're in. Okay, Hal, last question to you. Do you think this is going to end peacefully? You, you're promoting a coexistence of the two systems. Sure. Is it going to end well? Uh, I believe they're going to end well because the single way out is uh, and then the solution between Hong Kong and Beijing. And that's the, they have to, uh, the homework they have to do right now. And sit down at the table and start talking. That's right. Sherry, we could talk more at some point about extending the Freedoms Pla Pass 2047. We're out of time, though. I'd like to thank all of our viewers from around the world for joining us on Quadriga today. And of course, our guests here as well. I'm Brian Thomas. For all of us, thanks so much for being with us today.